Hello, Salem Covenant Church. This is Dale Gentry coming back with week two of the Faith 2020 Exploring the Intersection of Science and Christian Faith Sunday School class. I hope that this first week was interesting and insightful and that we can move forward now and uh, try and get a clearer sense of how these two fields of knowledge interact and how we can uh, both encourage and support people as they seek understanding and wrestle with this. As we learned last week, this is a point of contention for many people and a source of conflict as they sometimes wrestle with how to understand um, the inner the intersection of these two, making sure that their faith can remain strong and their understanding of the natural world and their pursuit of scientific education can remain strong. So I'm going to share my slides here and we will um, get, move forward. I'm going to, all right, here we are again, back in week two of exploring the intersection of science and Christian faith. And our first week last week, for those of you that weren't able to, uh, watch and listen to it is available on YouTube if you're interested. And I think the link is still available through Salem. We discussed the tension between science and Christian faith and both the problems that it causes, and it causes some people to walk away from their faith. It causes people to uh, not even explore Christianity. It causes us to not pursue um, careers in science for Christians. It causes all kinds of problems, and it prevents us from interacting with God through God's creation. And it exists for a number of different reasons as well. Uh, you know, the tension between scripture and science and the tension between science and religion is way, uh, ways of knowing and the, the scientific method, etc. So this week we're going to talk about the models of interaction between science and, and faith and try and outline what it means for them to have a complementary existence. How, how does it work for science and Christian faith to be a complementary approach to reality? And then again, next week, we're going to uh, tackle some contemporary issue, and it just seems like we would be crazy to tackle anything more than the coronavirus pandemic. Some of you might have uh, information overload on that, but I, I, I hope and I, and, I, and I sense that this is what's on people's minds so we can engage with other topics, but this just seems to uh, be what sometimes weighing us down, but certainly preoccupying our, 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 our awareness of what's going on in the world. And so let's just, um, let's, uh, approach that. So we'll talk about coronavirus and try and see what a complementary approach from science and faith can, can deliver th there. So again, for those of you that did see last week's, um, presentation, I am going to argue that science and Christian faith are both uh, legitimate and, and valid approaches to seeking understanding and that they are complementary and not conflicting. And so as we look at complementary relationships, what, what does that mean? What can we glean from studying other types of complementary relationships? In my life as an ecologist, we do a lot of studying the intersection between two different species and what happens when they um, try and eat the same resource or go after the same mate or whatever. And uh, this happens in lots of different ways, but we we highlight where some species interact in sort of a cooperative, sort of a complementary existence where they find ways to live in the same place and not have a huge amount of conflict. And then other species where that doesn't work as well, where there is competition, uh, where they are trying to access the same food source or the same meat or whatever it is. And so what we want to understand is what's different between co these cooperative relationships and these competitive relationships. And I think the same plays out for human societies and human relationships. Uh, I, I think this uh, makes sense for for marriages, right? In in a in a relationship, in my marriage at least, when my wife and I are working best together, it's because we are cooperating and we have different assignments, right? One of us is is preparing the meal and the other person is taking care of the children or one person is, you know, helping the kids with their schoolwork and the other person is cleaning the house. And if we're trying to do the same job, if we're both trying to prepare the meal and nobody's taking care of the children, it's not going to go well. 
right? Maybe you could apply the same concept to your workplace. Uh, everybody has a different responsibility. And if everybody's trying to give the big presentation to the board of directors and nobody is responsible for um, keeping uh, hold of the data and manipul- and understanding all the data that we get about how to run the, the store, right? it just doesn't work. I think so. The, the takeaway is that co- cooperative relationships and collaborative relationships mean we have different responsibilities. And I think that this is a good approach to looking at how science and Christian faith overlap. We need to ask, are they conflicting? Meaning, are they trying to answer the same questions? Are their answers competing or can they both be true? Are they using the same methods to get at their um, that the you know the answers they provide or the or just the, the meaning that's driven from uh, just that we derive from them? So conflict or complementary science and faith, and again, I'm going to argue that they are complementary, and complementary in part by not using the same methods, not trying to answer the same questions, and not offering competing answers. So what does that look like? Now, this is um, this this starts to fall into the world of philosophy, but it's not super technical philosophy. So it's just going to sound like like logic to many of us. So there are generally most people think three different approaches to this intersection of science and faith. And, and let's I've already talked about conflict versus um, uh, complementary, but let's just kind of understand the nature of those of those views. So those who believe that there that there is conflict between science and religion, they they basically think that that science and and the Bible, in the case of Christian religion, should tell us the same information about the same issues, the same kinds of things about the same things. So, for example, they're both about you know, humans and the earth and our existence and our reality. And so people that believe that there's conflict for the atheists, or there are actually theists, Christians that hold the same view, and they take what we call a a concordist approach. They say that, yeah, God, if, if scripture is revealed by God, and if God knows everything, then God must have corrected the understandings of the authors of scripture so God revealed novel scientific information to the authors of Scripture, and everything that Scripture contains should be without error in science and in history and in religious um, meaning and interpretations. Okay, So those that believe in conflict, which tend to be people that don't, you know, on the side that don't adhere to theism, see it this way. They say, well, we, we think they shouldn't be telling us the same thing. We think they're not telling us the same thing. Therefore, there's conflict. But we also see uh, some uh, concordists. Um, I think that this tends to fall into the area of a more fundamentalist side of Christianity. That might be a little bit of a pejorative term, and I don't want to turn anybody off or make anyone feel um, called out, but they will also say the same thing. Science and Bible should tell us the same thing, but they and they also acknowledge that they're not telling us the same thing, so they reject mainstream science, and they sort of craft a science of their own that's based off of um, of using the Bible to inform those answers and sometimes use it, letting biblical interpretations supplant the scientific interpretations. Okay, so we have two very different polar opposite groups with the same belief that science and the Bible should tell us the same kind of things about the same kind of things. That's confusing, right? So they're both giving us the same answers, they're both addressing the same reality. Okay, the, a, a different view, an independent view of science and religion is that science and the Bible tell us different kinds of things about different kinds of things, right? So basically that science tells us about the earth and the world and the plants and animals and the rocks and the universe and astronomy and physics and et cetera, et cetera. And the Bible tells us about our spiritual reality. It's about heaven, it's about salvation, it's about sanctification, it's all these religious concepts, and that there is basically a 
a metaphorical wall between the two and that one should be kept in one box. Science is going to uh, tackle the natural world and that the Bible and religion is going to tackle the supernatural world. And if everybody stays in their box, if everybody stays on their side of the wall, then we're not going to have any problems. And this is the, the independent model. This is a model very famously taken by um, a now deceased uh, Harvard paleontologist named Stephen Jay Gould. He was kind of in the public consciousness for a while, and especially in the 80s and 90s. He had a, a regular column in uh, the New York Times, um, and so was quite well known. And he he said that, that science and religious faith are what he called non-overlapping magisteria. And so they just, they, they don't, they don't overlap. They don't approach the same information or they don't approach the same topics. They don't provide the same information. So he was an agnostic or uh, atheist probably, um, but he was, had no problem with religion because he says religion's not trying to tackle the same questions that I am trying to tackle with science. Okay. So that's the independent uh, model. Some people might be quite content with that. I find it um, it's nice that they're not conflicting, but I find it not satisfactory because if God is the creator of the universe, then, then we should be able to derive some meaning from God's creation. And so I think the Bible is, is going to leak into, uh, uh, our understanding of the natural world and the natural world, I think can inform our understanding of God. So for me, this is, uh, appealing and that there's no conflict, but inadequate. And then we have this last approach, which is this, what I call complementary approach. Some people call it a, a dialogue where science and faith are in dialogue with each other, where science and the Bible tell us different kinds of things about the same things. So they're both approaching our existence, our reality, our lives, but they're uh, they're trying to provide different answers, right? So science on the left there is trying to explain how things work. How does the climate work? How, how does geolo how do geological processes work? How do our bodies function? My life as an ecologist, I'm trying to understand how species interact with each other and the, and with the, the non-living, uh, world, right? So science is trying to understand how the world works and provide explanations that can be tested and understood. And religion is trying to create meaning and purpose. It explains why things are here. So they are both approaching the same existence, but, but trying to provide different answers. And that is, again, sort of the dialogue or complementary approach that I think uh, Christians should pursue. I think that it is fruitful. Uh, this is not just my perception and my opinion. This is a perception held by many, many, many wise um, uh, ministers and scientists and philosophers and theologians. This is those of us that, that believe that we can be science, we can, that we can be Christians and engage with the scientific world. We, we, we take this approach. So let's um, see how it pans out. Later we see this beautiful tree. What can science tell us about this tree? What can Christianity tell us about this tree? Well, clearly science can tell us, you know, what the identity, what species is it. It can tell us how uh, photosynthesis functions and how the metabolic processes of the, the plant um, uh, function. It can tell us some of the story of the, uh, the role that it plays in its ecosystem and if other animals eat it or not. It can tell us what it's made up of and take it apart and, you know, determine that it's made out of carbon and hydrogen, and oxygen and phosphorus and nitrogen and all of the different, um, chemical components. It can, you know, it, it, it can give us all these explanations about the nature of this tree. But what it can't tell us is if this tree has any purpose outside of, you know, uh, photosynthesis, outside of being a food source, outside of being, you know, creating timber or whatever. 
it, it can't tell us if it has any any purpose on an existential sense, a purpose that comes from outside of the system. We can try and uh, define a purpose for it. It creates wood, which we are d- dependent on, but that's purpose that comes from inside the system. Does it have any purpose from outside? Is it trying to convey any meaning that is uh, beyond what we can uh, assign to it uh, through science? So Christianity, again, tries to explain more meaning and purpose. Science explains how things work. It pulls things apart. And uh, I think that they can coexist, right? So complementary approach to science and faith says that science and reason are going to approach certain questions like how the world and the universe works and what it contains. And religion then is going to provide meaning and purpose. And that in order for them to work well, they are maybe not going to step on each other's toes too much, but they are still going to approach the same topics. They are both going to approach the supernatural world, but also the natural world. And that's different from that independent model. So let's let's look at a, a, uh, an example of this. If we just approach the story of Jesus, uh, I think that we have to engage both science and faith to get the full account of what's going on here. Because without um, the scientific study of history and archeology, span I don't think we can say with confidence that, you know, that what this story is all about. Uh, What I'm trying to get at is that much of my confidence in following Jesus is that there are good historic accounts uh, and, and confidence among uh, respectable historians that Jesus did walk this earth, that Jesus did perform feats and wonders, that Jesus had a following, that Jesus uh, died and was crucified, and that people report seeing Jesus alive again after his death on the cross. Those are questions for history. They come out, some of the answers come out of our religious texts, although there are answers from beyond our religious texts as well. But those are questions that reason and science is going to try and answer. But what reason and science can't help us with is what we should do about that story, what that story means. If Jesus was resurrected from the dead, then what? Right? That's a story for religious faith, where religion tells us that if Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, and if Jesus died and was resurrected, then you have to follow him. You have to, you have to believe everything he said because of this feat of his resurrection, right? Paul gives us a framework for that himself. He says, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then our whole faith is a farce. So I think that scripture does sometimes contain both um, uh, history and reason and maybe some science, and it contains Uh, explanations for meaning and purpose and what it means that Jesus was raised from the dead. It means that Jesus is the Messiah, right? So um, some people might argue um, from certain uh, corners of Christianity, all we need is our religious faith. And from a certain perspective, uh, I'm on board with that. Certainly, I believe that the religious, my religious faith is the most important thing. It is the, the, the most important question to get right, right? I'm okay getting some scientific answers incorrect. I want to get this one right. But if we go back in time to a point before the development of science, what we'll see is that, that we had some 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 problems that science helped us address. And so while you know, technically, do we need more than religious faith? That's that's debatable. But is life better with both? Absolutely. All right. So before the scientific revolution, which started roughly in the uh, mid 1500s with um, Copernicus and his publication of, of what's often called just De Rev, which is basically the, the re- revolution of the celestial bodies is how it's translated. Before that, we had a flawed view of the universe. We believed that God created the universe to revolve around us, quite literally, and that we are the sole thing that God cared about. We're the sole planet, the sole species, sort of. I think we had a very anthropocentric view of the physical universe. 
And when Copernicus and Galileo corrected that view, my goodness, it opened up a whole sense that we don't have to be at the center of God's reality to experience his grace and love. And that's actually quite a transformative idea that the earth doesn't have to be the, the, the most unique planet, and we don't have to be the most unique individuals. We don't have to be the only humans. Um, you know, there are seven billion of us, and God's got enough love for all of us. So we had a flawed view of the universe. We had, I think, a flawed view of Scripture. And many people would support this, that we used Scripture to try and answer scientific questions like the position of the universe, uh, or sorry, the position of the earth and how the world works. And we now believe, most of us, that Scripture was not written to explain the position of the earth in the universe. It doesn't give us an accurate account of the Milky Way galaxy or our solar system or the broad expanse of the universe. So scripture um, was written to answer certain questions, but maybe not every question, maybe not those questions about how the, the earth is structured and how material creation functions. We had a flawed understanding as an example of that, of things like illness and suffering. We believe that illness was a punishment from God. That's clearly evident in Job, but that persisted even up into the um, you know 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. Um, and so we now understand more that illnesses, cause, illnesses are caused by bacteria and viruses. Now, there may be spiritual components to that as well. And the point is that those two things are not mutually exclusive. But without science, we, we had um, flawed understanding of our, of our physical existence. And I think an understanding of our physical existence gives us insight into the God who created it. So do we need more than religious faith? I don't know if we absolutely need it, but we certainly benefit from integrating science into our religious faith. Now, that idea that science was able to provide those understandings has led, as you may or may not be aware, to many people thinking, maybe we don't need religion, maybe we only need science. So here's a, a different question, do we need more than science? What if we didn't have religious faith as a growing number of people in our society are, are heading in that direction? They are becoming atheists. They are becoming agnostic. Well, without science, many people argue, now there's some debate about this as well, that science cannot adequately address what I think are the most fundamental aspects of humanity, what our, our human nature to believe that love is better than hate, that forgiveness is better than revenge, that our lives have meaning and authentic purpose that comes from outside of the system, not just one that we create for ourselves, that is inaccessible to science, right? So science cannot address these worldview questions about who am I and why am I here and where am I going and What's my purpose on this planet? Um, so without science, we get stuck um, addressing those questions and sometimes coming up with answers that I have no purpose and there is no meaning to life. And we see the gross growth of this nihilistic um, uh, experience of life. So uh, um, many people believe that, that science and faith are, are uh, uh, an appropriate analogy is that they are, are left, like left and right hemispheres of our brain. That our left hemisphere, as some of you may be aware, uh, what we say are sort of left-brained things, our analytical, reasoned, scientific, rational thought, uh, very much our, our math and science is largely being done here, our logic is being done here. Uh, but on the right side, of, uh, so if we had just our left side of our brain, we would be very good at those sorts of things, right? We'd be good at at, at ration, rational thought and reason and science and, um, and analysis of things. But we might wrestle and struggle to grasp art. We might struggle to be empathetic. We might be, um, you know, we might lack a sense of our emotional self. We might... Um, have a hard time with intuition. 
right? But in the same way, if we had only our right brain, we would be good at those things, but we wouldn't be good at science and reason. So, um, so uh, Jonathan Sack, who's a, a Jewish rabbi, argues that science and religion are like the r- left and right hemispheres of the brain. If you have only the left or only the right, you're, you're, you're missing half of the story of reality. So science and religion work together to um, create both an understanding of the natural world and meaning and purpose. So what, what, what happens then when they do conflict? Because this sounds lovely that they can just coexist and one does the explanations of how and the other does meaning and purpose, but we do know they still conflict. So we have to be reminded that the conflicts are caused by flawed human understandings because some people just jump to an authentic conflict. We talked about that, right? That the concordist view or the conflicting view, they just say that this, these two interpretations are just, they're inherently conflicting. I think that's wrong. We have to recognize the conflicts are caused by humans and that those humans have bias and they have assumptions that are probably driving those conflicts. And I want to just highlight really quickly a couple of assumptions that have been historically problematic. Okay, so one assumption that has been historically problematic is that scripture was written to reveal scientific concepts and knowledge that God whispered into the ears of the authors of scripture and corrected their scientific misunderstandings and that everything we see in scripture is scientifically accurate. That is an assumption that I had for a portion of my life and many people still have. I am at a place now where I just I just don't believe that is the correct assumption. I'll talk about why that is in just a moment. Another assumption that is a, that is problematic is that because scientists cannot measure or understand the immaterial realm, then it does not exist, right? This idea that if science can't measure or understand it, then it doesn't authentically exist. And that's clearly problematic as well. That's why many scientists have dismissed God, because they say, where's the evidence for God? Without recognizing that, you know, if if there's mystery in light and there's mystery in matter and there's mystery in consciousness, it's okay that there's some mystery in God as well and that we might not be able to measure God with uh, the tools of science. So I just want to real quickly address this idea that, that that first assumption that Bible was written to reveal scientific concepts, because I think for many Christians, depending on which corner of Christianity you have lived in for your life, you might find that a tough pill to swallow. You you maybe have been told that everything in the Bible is is, is very simply um, uh, true. So there are a couple different views on divine inspiration and inerrancy. Um, and I think that those concepts sometimes cause confusion. I am an inerrantist, but I also believe that there are scientific errors in the Bible. How does that work? Let me explain it. So there, um, one view is what uh, some scholars call comprehensive inerrancy. The scripture is inerrant, it's without flaw, end to end, regardless of culture, era, or interpretation, right? This would be that concordist approach to scripture. They say that that everything in scripture is accurate. If there are 4,000 people being fed, that means there was not 4,001. There were not 999. Everything in scripture is word for word, simple and accurate. And then another approach is what we call sometimes divine accommodation. And divine accommodation says that God allowed the authors of scripture to write through their understandings of the world, not his. And not only just like, oh, that's an idea, but it's an important idea because they say that the scriptures then could be understood by the audience to whom they were um, they were inspired, uh, f- uh, and I think this is important. And this is a from, from my perspective, this is important to assume that if God corrected all the all of our understandings, if God you know wanted us to understand the universe on His terms and was written describing dark matter and dark energy, which is just crazy to us. Then, then you know, scripture would not have been understood by the original culture or by this culture because, you know, in part because of this idea that God's ways are not our ways. 
So here are two different approaches to scripture and science, comprehensive inerrancy where everything is accurate down to the every um, T and I being dotted and crossed, or God allows the authors to write through their understandings, meaning some of their understandings and their flawed understandings of the world might make it into scripture. Well, I think this is a testable question, right? We can go into scripture and seek to see uh, if it has any evidence of an ancient understanding of the world. And I believe that it does. Um, I believe that scripture, you know, gives the impression of a geocentric view of the world that you know, was was the only view prior to Copernicus. I believe that there's evidence that, you know, the authors of Scripture believed in a flat earth. We see things in the New Testament, even words from Jesus, where Jesus says that the mustard seed is the smallest seed. Um, and we now know that it's not. There are seeds that are much smaller. Uh, Jesus tells us, right, that the look at the birds, they don't sow or reap, and yet God provides food for them. When in fact, there are a few species of birds that, that sow food away for months and come back and eat it months later. Does that mean that Jesus was wrong and that we need to toss the Bible out? No, Jesus was teaching and talking and the authors of the Old Testament were teaching and talking in terms that would have um, made sense to them and made sense to their audience. And God accommodated that. He let them write it in a way so that they could understand it rather than a, a way that only he could understand it. So that's an approach I take to some of these perceived conflicts between what we see in scripture and what we see in science, that if we have great confidence that the scientific conclusion is true, we can uh, accept that, that God accommodated the understandings of the authors of scripture. Now, I, that probably is stirring up all types of questions and maybe some controversy, and perhaps we can uh, um, answer those questions during our chat time on Sunday. Okay, so, um, so many uh, um, scientists have, have attempted to answer all these questions. And they say, we don't want religion. We want to use science to drive our meaning as well. Some scientists have, have tried to, to tackle these worldview questions, but most people think that the answers provided by science are inadequate. That basically the answers they give are that, are that our humanity is just a, a coincidence of natural selection, uh, that our lives don't have authentic purpose and meaning, but we can create authentic. We can create purpose and meaning for ourselves. We see the growth of a um, sort of an atheistic religion called secular humanism, which says that humans can um, assign meaning and purpose to our own lives, even though it's not something that comes from outside of the system. Uh, and and I would argue, and I think many people would agree that that our sense of, of love and, and connection and meaning and purpose that I think every human on this planet is searching for. What was I created for? What does it mean to be a human? Why do I have this consciousness that those questions are deserving of, of more thorough answers than what science can provide? So uh, I, I would actually argue that that um, that science is just the wrong tool for answering those questions. And I think that we're actually seeing progress in that direction. And much of that progress is coming not from scientists, although there are some scientists that are that are recognizing this as well, but religious leaders. And here are just a couple. Again, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, clearly I'm not Catholic and most of you are not as well, but I do um, respect the popes as religious as men, as follow, followers of Jesus. Pope John Paul II said, science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. So he thought he saw these things as working together. Billy Graham says, I don't think there's any conflict at all between science today and the scriptures. I think that we have misinterpreted the scriptures many times, and we've tried to make the scriptures say things they weren't meant to say. I think that we've made a mistake by thinking that the Bible is a scientific book, right? So we have leaders from the world of religion that are telling us that these two are compatible. And I actually think we're stepping into a future, uh, the next scientific revolution, in which the revolution is acknowledging that science can't answer all the questions. 
And again, we're seeing leadership here. And I'll just give you one quick example, although there are really dozens of examples that thousands of examples of of science, scientists that are acknowledging that, that religion has something to offer. Very recently, Marcelo Gleiser, I think, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, he's a physicist at Dartmouth, and he was just awarded last year the Templeton Award, which is an award for um, um, for scholars that are that are doing important work at the intersection of science and faith. And he is actually an agnostic, but he is vocally against atheism. Right, so he says, while I don't believe in God with confidence, and I can't understand God. I think it's wrong to say that science disproves God. And he is actually quite fascinating to listen to him uh, work through these worldview questions and the inability of science to provide um, decent answers to these questions of what does it mean to be a human and do we have meaning and purpose? So quite encouraging to see leaders in both the field of science and in religious circles uh, saying that that things work better when we use them both. Okay, so next week we will um, do this in a more practical way. We will apply our complementarian approach to science and faith to the coronavirus pandemic, which is why we are doing this class remotely. It's why we aren't in a room together to discuss this and instead are engaging with each other over an internet connection. I hope someday we can do it face-to-face. And I do want to leave you with some discussion questions that we can um, uh, dig into. Again, there is a um, sort of a a webinar, a chat time on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. for those of you that are able to make it. Okay, first... Uh, What aspects of the complementary approach to faith and science appeal to you? If you've never heard about it or thought about it before, uh, what what sounds good? What do you feel like gives you a clear understanding of how um, these two can coexist? Second question, what aspects of a complementary approach to faith and science turn you off? Maybe there are certain things that you feel like you are holding on to and you're not ready to let go of. Maybe it's that um, comprehensive inerrancy in scripture. For, uh, third question, are there topics, issues, sections in scripture that you think will not accommodate this approach, that they need to be held and understood through this certain view, which is contrary to what science believes? What are those? And lastly, are there topics, issues, sections in scriptures that are less contentious, uh, that 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 this approach can help address, that this complementary approach can help solve, that, that, that were previously you thought were conflicting. So what are the areas in scripture that are now less contentious with this complementarian approach? All right, I hope you found this interesting and insightful. I look forward to speaking with you about this. If you have questions, I would love it if you could uh, sign in for that webinar time on Wednesday morning. Um, and if not, here are my here's my contact information. You can email me uh, or or contact me through Twitter at email uh, disciplescience1 at gmail.com or djgentry at unwsp.edu or through Twitter. You can reach me at dalegentrymn or at disciplescience and I will be able to respond to any of those. Again, thanks for your time. I hope all of you in the midst of our uh, isolation and Uh, social distancing, are able to find ways to show grace and love to each other, show kindness and compassion, uh, to, to smile and engage with people, even if you aren't in close proximity. Um, and that this Sunday school class is just a very small part of, of the connection that you retain with, with church. God bless. Stay safe. We'll talk again next week.